I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Francesco Egro, Nikki Phillips, and Ira Savetsky. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the April 2019 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. My name is Francesco Egro, PRS Resident Ambassador from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And as always, I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Ira Savetsky from NYU and Nikki Phillips from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. Today, we have the great honor of being joined by Dr. Amanda Gosman as our guest moderator. Dr. Gosman is the Chief of the Division of Plastic Surgery, Director of Craniofacial and Pediatric Plastic Surgery, Residency Program Director, and Craniofacial Fellowship Director at the University of California, San Diego. Thank you so much, Dr. Gosman, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Thank you. Before we dive in into our discussion, I want to remind everyone that this article, along all of the articles that are discussed on our podcast, can be read for free on prsjournal.com. The article we will be discussing today is entitled 20-Year Experience with 202 Segmental Mandibulectomy Defects, a Defect Classification System, Algorithm for Flap Selection, and Surgical Outcomes by Dr. Cordero, Henderson, and Matros. I think this is a great article to discuss because reconstruction following segmental mandibulectomy is extremely challenging and it requires functional and aesthetic considerations. Multiple mandibulectomy defect classifications exist but are either too complicated or do not take into account defect size or soft tissue involvement. And the authors aim to develop a classification system that includes defect size, quality and functional anesthetic significance. So the authors performed a retrospective cohort study of all patients undergoing an immediate reconstruction of mandibulectomy defects by a single surgeon between 1992 and 2011. They looked at patient demographics, descriptors, and outcomes of the bony and soft tissue defects and their reconstructions. And based on this, they then came up with a classification and reconstructive algorithm that was used in all their patients. And the defects were divided into three types based on defect location and size, starting from type 1, which describes anterior mandibular defects, type 2 describes hemimandibular defects, type 3 describes lateral mandibular defects that are limited in size to either the body, angle, or ascending ramus of the mandible. And each of these are further subdivided into A, B, C, and D. A if no soft tissue defect is present, B, if intraoral structure and or mucosal lining defect only is present, C, if a skin defect only is present, and D, if both are present. In terms of flap choice, the author used uh, fibular flaps with or without skin paddle for type 1 anterior defects. In hemimandibulectomy defects, the authors used uh, fibular flaps with or without skin paddle for type 2A, 2B1, and 2C, whereas for those that involved more intraoral structures or both skin and intraoral structures, VRAMs were used. Whereas in type 3 limited lateral mandibular defects, the reconstructed options varied much more depending on the size and location of the defect. For example, 3A defects were reconstructed with fibular osseous flaps. 3B defects with some kind of osteocutaneous flap, such as, you know, fibula, radioforum, or scapula. 3C defects, again, with a fibula osteocutaneous flap. And lastly, 3D defects with either a two-skin island fibula osteocutaneous flap or a combination of fibular osteocutaneous flap with radioforum fasciocutaneous flap. I'm very sorry about the lettering and numbering, which can get very confusing, but I highly recommend to our listeners to check out the very clear illustrations of the article. The authors operated on a total of 202 patients, mostly male, with a mean age of 52 years and a mean follow-up of 61 months. 11% of patients underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy and 48% underwent adjuvant radiation therapy. These 202 patients underwent 211 flaps, 19% were non-osseous only, and 81% were osseous containing, with the majority, i.e. 91%, being an osseous or osteocutaneous fibula flap, and the majority of the non-osseous flaps were VRAMs. The overall recipient site complication rate was 13%, with no significant difference between osseous or non-osseous flaps, and the complete flap loss rate was 0%, so really it can't get any better than that. 
and partial flap loss rate was 6% and there was no statistical significant difference between osseous and non-osseous flaps. I thought this was a very good paper that I'm sure it will be referenced many times in the future and while many classifications have been brought forward in the past, this is the first classification that takes into detailed account both the osseous defect as well as the soft tissue defect and therefore addressing the mandibular reconstruction at its full. I commend the authors for a large cohort and for sharing their extensive experience in mandibular reconstruction though a criticism of this paper is that it would have been nice to have a breakdown of outcomes within each type of reconstruction so you know type 1a type 1b and so on also i was extremely surprised that the authors performed only one alt which honestly here in pittsburgh is the workhorse flap together with free fibula also i was surprised that there was no specification of when to use a reconstruction plate especially since in many patients who are perhaps too unstable for long free flap surgeries it might be an adequate alternative i definitely think that having an algorithm might be helpful and it can certainly facilitate the clinical decision making, especially for young surgeons like myself. However, in practical terms, I feel that it is more of an academic exercise. And in the majority of cases, the algorithm includes, at least here, a free fibula plus or minus another flap, depending on the defect needing reconstruction. We do a ton of head and neck reconstruction here in Pittsburgh, and truthfully, we never discuss the reconstruction options based on a classification, but rather more in terms of defect size, location, and tissue involved. Dr. Gosman, I was wondering what your thoughts were on this paper, first of all, but also if in practice, have you ever used classifications to reconstruct mandibulectomy defects? I think this is a very interesting paper, and it represents a long-term follow-up of a very large patient series with a very impressively low complication rate. I think that classification systems can be very useful when you're looking at a patient population such as this where there is a lot of heterogeneity in the defect and different surgical approaches that can be used. I think that classification systems, although I, I haven't used them personally for mandibulectomy defects, are certainly well suited for looking at outcomes within these certain subgroups and I agree with you it would be nice to break down some of the outcomes that were reported by the specific classification of the defect that was used as well as by the type of reconstruction. I think that creating an algorithm is also very useful in terms of kind of comparing those long-term outcomes in addition to just looking at complication rate some of the things that I think would be interesting to include would also be how the functional outcomes were for these patients in terms of their mobility, whether or not they were able to functionally return to oral feeding, how their speech was, and even looking at some of the validated quality of life tools that we have for patients with head and neck cancer because I think that would give us additional information. But I think when setting the stage for looking at long-term outcomes, it is useful to create some type of classification system when there is a wide range of defects that can be seen within kind of a certain diagnosis group. Thanks, Dr. Gosman. I 100% agree with you. I mean, honestly, out of all the reconstructions that we do, I feel that these patients really provide a fair challenge and I agree that it would be really nice to see functional outcomes as well as surgical outcomes that are listed here. Nikki, what are your thoughts about this paper? I agree with what's been said so far. I thought this was a really impressive paper. The length of follow-up of the patients, you know, and the number of patients, you know, sort of speak for themselves, but as I was reading through the paper, one of the things I was thinking about was when we go into these surgeries, we don't always know exactly what our resection margins are going to be. We certainly have an idea. We hope that we've counseled people as appropriately as we can. But Dr. Gosman, I'm wondering about your own personal experience with preparing patients for these types of surgeries and knowing that there are sort of all these different reconstructive plans that we may have to turn to based on what the defect looks like. How do we have that conversation with patients and their families ahead of time? That's a great question. I think that as much as possible, you know, having some type of guideline is very helpful, especially when counseling the patient. I think we anticipate, at least in generalities, the type of resection that's going to take place and certainly the type of soft tissue defect. The more that we understand about that, the better we're going to be able to discuss that with the patient and their family. 
I think that in this day and age where we use a lot of virtual surgical planning and computer aided design, that that also plays a role in allowing us to kind of evaluate the defect and determine what's going to be our best reconstructive option. I think frequently we're not able to perform the surgery exactly as we plan. So there always needs to be kind of some leeway in terms of, you know, how we're going to apply the reconstruction plate or whatever needs to be done for the bony reconstruction. But I think that we should be able to use that type of technology to help us prepare in our mind and narrow down what those surgical options are so it's not quite such a guessing game. And I think that's really where a lot of the value in that planning lies. And certainly always kind of having your A, B, and C of your backup plans to address concerns if there is more soft tissue that's removed or if your bony defect is larger than you anticipate is something that should also be discussed with the family. But trying to narrow that as much as possible by planning things out in advance, I think is beneficial for you and for the patient. And I think that's also where some of these you know, the utility of classification and algorithmic thinking come into play when you look at, you know, different areas of defect and what you think you're going to definitely need. Absolutely. That's something I hadn't even thought about, but I'm sure that the visual aids, you know, that are sort of allowed by virtual planning are probably very helpful for patients and their family to understand a little bit more of what we know is coming, but they don't understand as well. So I think that's a a great point. Ira, what were your thoughts about this article? I agree with all the comments that were said, and and I too thought this was a very interesting study. As we know, reconstruction of the mandible is very complex and challenging. Dr. Cordero, Dr. Matros, and the rest of the surgeons at Memorial are really true experts when it comes to mandible reconstruction, and this tradition really goes back to Dr. Hudago, who is one of the pioneers of mandible reconstruction using the fibula. Like Francesco, I found the classification system and reconstructive algorithm to be quite useful and it simplifies the approach to the reconstructive plan. Having spent some time at Memorial last year as part of our training program, I found that some of the reconstructive surgeons use computer-aided design and manufacturing, whereas there were some who did not. And I know we sort of touched on virtual surgical planning a little bit before. At NYU, we typically use it. Dr. Gossman, what are some of your thoughts about using it, and are the faculty at your institution using it? Yes, I think it's very valuable, but I think I feel like we're still a little bit within that kind of craniofacial analogy where you like measure to the millimeter and cut to the inch. So it's not quite as exact when you get into the operating room. There are some limitations of it, but I think the ability to look at surgical models and to have models that are available intraoperatively that can help you to adapt whatever your plan is can definitely be time-saving you know, specifically determining cutting guides for your fibula and how those pieces are going to fit together can be very, very useful. I think one of the main limitations that I see if you were to completely plan it out and try to stick to that plan is just the customized 3D printed plates for reconstruction aren't really things that can be adapted. So that's one limitation. I find it very useful as well. Just as Francesco mentioned that he was a little surprised to see not as many perforator flaps used for reconstruction. I think that as they report the data going forward, I know this paper went to about 2011. I think going forward, we will see more and more of that in their reconstructive algorithm. Dr. Gosman, I also had another question, uh, if I may. As mentioned earlier, I was rather surprised to see that only one ALT was performed since this flap is truly our workhorse flap in head and neck reconstruction here in Pittsburgh. And I've never seen news for larger mandibular defects, VRAM flaps, but rather a combination of osteocutaneous and facial cutaneous flaps. My question to you, Dr. Gosman, but also to Nikki and Ira, is whether in your institutions VRAMs are used for mandibulectomy defects, and if so, what was the indication? At our institution, as it sounds like at Pittsburgh, definitely the ALT is our workhorse for soft tissue flap. I think, you know, as much as possible, try to avoid taking, you know, large functional muscles such as the rectus if possible. 
so we can usually obtain adequate soft tissue bulk if it's just a large soft tissue defect within ALT if needed and occasionally that would be in combination with uh, an osseous containing flap and our protocol is similar in that if we had a complex soft tissue defect it would probably be more of a skin paddle with a fibula and a a radial forearm or an ALT if we needed additional soft tissue coverage. I think, you know, the ALT offers a lot of versatility in being able to, you can bring in muscle and fascia and things like that. I would be interested to see, you know, going back to the question of outcomes, how outcomes are for those patients with the VRAM in terms of both the function of the head and neck and, you know, just looking at, you know, kind of the donor site morbidity that goes along with the rectus muscle sacrifice. Yeah, absolutely. And also because it was mostly used for hemimandibulectomy defects. So not only the recipient side, but as you said, the donor side. What about Nikki and Ira? What's happening in your institutions? Ira here. I mean, same thing as Pitt and San Diego. Perforator flaps are typically our workhorse for soft tissue reconstruction. Again, the ALT certainly. And, you know, if you don't need as much tissue bulk... Oftentimes, we'll go to a medial sural artery perforator flap instead of the radial forearm, which really we've been using quite frequently in the past couple of years. So yeah, I would say perforator flaps for the most part. I would echo that. I think, of course, it's always taken on a case-by-case basis. And so if a patient needs you know, a really bulky, large flap, certainly we've talked about VRAM as an option. But for the most part, I've seen smaller perforator-based flaps, or really, honestly, mostly the free fibula flap with skin paddles for reconstruction. That's great. Thanks. It's really interesting to know what other institutions and what other residents are learning. So thank you all so much. And I really enjoyed today's podcast. And I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your friends and rate us in the iTunes store. Also, remember to tune in to the other two articles we will be discussing on this month's podcast. And finally, please join us this month for our monthly journal club on Facebook, where we'll be able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not done so. And it is there where our monthly journal club takes place. Once again, Dr. Gosman, it was an honor having you on our podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. (laughs)